Pretty eyes, pretty thighs, shawty she a dime Demon girl, evil eyes, she be telling lies so today, it's my pleasure to interview Dr. Ruz, Ruz uh, Jafari, CEO of Epicor Biosystems. So Dr. Jafari, so thank you for being part of this episode. So, you know, I mean, you, I mean, so you're doing a lot of, you know, big things. So can we start with you taking us back and telling us about your background? Sure, I can uh, maybe uh, provide a little bit of background on my um, uh, education as well as uh, motivations. Uh, so my... Uh, Research and efforts have stemmed across both translational as well as um, uh, commercialization-based deployments of, of various bio-wearable types of products. And um, uh, I, for me, uh, the, the research, translation, and commercialization all came together by way of uh, my uh technology focused background in uh, the biomedical sciences. So I studied at MIT, um, my undergrad, grad school, uh, postdoc, and um, really understood um, uh, and found uh, a lot of uh, uh, joy in doing just research at, at the fundamental level. Uh, uh, and, you know, that research was in the area of neuroscience, cochlear mechanics, looking at how auditory mechanisms happen uh, and how we hear um, sounds ranging from a pin drop all the way through to uh, a, a roaring jet engine. Um, and uh, so that foundational research really uh, had a lot of underpinning um, biosensor work related to it, uh, microfluidics, uh, a lot of different engineering disciplines came together. Um, and once I graduated, um, I met some very uh, key mentors that uh, helped uh, really uh, drive me forward, uh, not just on the science-based side, but all, also on the more applied engineering side. And um, so I, over the past 15 years or so now, uh, have spent a lot of time in the wearable uh, biotech sector. Yeah, so uh, I just want to ask you, I think, <laughs> Uh, I think it was a year. I think years ago, I, I think it, it was a taboo for biomedical engineers to or, or scientists to join the the tech their their the tech or the biotech companies. So, about first of all, why do you think this taboo exists, and do you think it's still continuing, or are scientists turn branch out towards founding their own companies? Yeah, I think there's definitely been a shift over the past ten years, maybe maybe even a little bit longer um, in taking um, research at, at the fundamental level um, and finding ways to translate and uh, deliver to um, maximum potential. And what I mean by that is commercialize and get it out in the hands of, of people uh, uh, to use. So whether that's a new drug um, and research that leads to that or a medical device or some other type of uh, more tangible type of technology. Um, I think academia has certainly embraced it. Entrepreneurship as a whole, um, uh, I, I felt it at MIT, but I, I think it's happening across Northwestern University, where I'm affiliated now uh, on the uh, research faculty side, as well as uh, many other schools, West Coast, East School, East Coast, as well as other places. So. Um, it, it is a relatively new phenomenon um, and one that I think has um, adoption and utility in mind. Um, and, you know, that's really where I built my career out of uh, doing the academic work, but then figuring out ways of overcoming the, the big chasm that exists from academia to more commercial translational efforts. Hmm. I mean, so I mean, you co-authored. Uh, I think it was a plan for diagnostics for all. So it was a nonprofit health organization spun out of Dr. Whiteside's lab. So can you talk more about this plan and how you thought of it? Yeah. So it was uh, diagnostics for all was a company or a nonprofit um, organization that we um, had um, 
spun out as uh, sort of a, a cool idea. And there were a few folks involved, Professor George Whitesides being the lead, as well as uh, countless others uh, on the research, as well as uh, on the business development side. And I uh, was fortunate enough to, to work with uh, Professor Whitesides and the team on some of the more business plan oriented efforts. And that led to our um, entry and uh, ultimately um, winning the um, MIT 100K and the uh, Harvard Business School uh, Social Enterprise Contest. Um, it, it was really fun for me, actually. It sort of gave uh, a quick window into uh, all the possibilities on the translational side and um, everything we're doing now at Epicor. Um, you know, in some ways stems from learnings um, dating back to that diagnostics for all experience and, you know, launching that nonprofit. So um, I think, you know, that's a pretty good example of a academic technology research that led to some new um, uh, market traction and uh, ultimately um, uh, figuring out ways to get it. Uh, diagnostic technology out to uh, a lot of people in developing countries. Yeah. So I mean, just want to, I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't know if you, if you want to answer or you care to answer on I mean, it. So how much money do you win from these contests in total? And, and uh, were there any challenges to winning these prizes? Yeah, this was a while back and, you know, typical um, entrepreneurship contests. They, they have some cash, Winnings associated with them. Uh, I think for MIT it was a hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, uh, and then for Harvard, uh, I think it was like fifty thousand, somewhere around there. So not not a lot to you know drive forward the business, but uh, enough of a uh, sort of a catalyst to get things underway. And I, I think what was more important than the the actual dollars and funding was the experience and the network. And then the recognition was, was altogether very helpful and getting, getting things off the ground. So uh, I know you made a uh, diagnosis for all a nonprofit. So why do you make it a nonprofit, not like a for-profit kind of venture? Yeah, there was uh, some discussion around that. Uh, and the idea was to provide access to um the people that need it most. And this was a microfluidic based technology that was low, low cost. So uh, the idea was um, to deploy it uh, with the, the uh, developing world in mind. Um, and so that, that was really the impetus why it was built that way so that um, it wasn't, you know, solely focused on, North America or Europe, but right out of the gates, the, the intent was to make sure that the people who need it most get access to it. And sometimes that doesn't align with a for-profit type of business plan and, and model. So if, if, if you're a for-profit company, you got to do whatever to, to make it through and, you know, bring revenues in. Um, uh, and so that may mean not really focusing in on developing countries and, you know, finding new markets that, that are higher profit, higher return. Uh, there is a, a conscious effort to not fall into that uh, type of trap um, uh, right out of the gates. I mean, I, I don't know if you know about this, but I think ChatGPT, this parent company was a nonprofit. Now they're kind of turning into a for-profit. So I mean, I mm. think I think I kind of agree about, about that kind of trap, you know. Yeah, no, it, it and the, the you know it's it's challenging either way to starting companies, whether it's for profit, non profit, takes a lot of effort and, and time, and there's high risk. So, yeah, every case is unique, uh, but that was really the 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 uh, the motivation going in um, for, for that endeavor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, have you thought of applying this? technology for COVID tests? Uh, so this was years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, we're talking like 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, there, there has been a lot of different uh, tests and things uh, that 
have spawned out um, and that are like lateral flow based tasks. So um, in general, I think uh, we didn't do it at the time because there was no uh, COVID related, but there were other types of biomarker tests that were pursued ultimately by diagnostics for all. Um, but uh, this was because it was preceding so many years ahead that we didn't even think about COVID, you know, circa 2008. Mm -hmm. So, um, so are you still part of this, this, uh, um, uh, this kind of your, your own company, your nonprofit or, uh, or, or have you moved on to other stuff? Yeah. So Epicor Biosystems is what, uh, has been my focus for the past, uh, six years, almost seven years now. And, um, that that's, uh, as of 2017 until now, uh, you know, another, um, microfluidics based, uh, set of technology, but in this particular example, uh, we're building wearable devices, uh, that could be worn on the body, um, to be able to measure various biomarkers, um, from your sweat, from your, um, skin temperature, motion, all, all of these various biometrics come together in one unified system and provide uh, feedback to the user as well as to uh, coaches if you're an athlete, managers if you're in a connected work site or to physicians ultimately down the road if, as we expand out for certain more mm -hmm. healthcare related applications. So. That's been the focus uh, for me for the past couple of years. And, um, uh, you know, the underlying theme is wearable, microtech, nanotech based technologies all coming together. So can you give us a run through of your daily life of a CEO? Sure. Uh, so, you know, we're a small company, about 20 people. Um, so my efforts really touch on uh, various facets of the of, of the company uh, from um thinking through our overall strategy and revenues and investment game plan versus you know making sure that we have like group lunch and you know ha having our outings and things so as a small company it's it's really fun for me to really uh impact all aspects of that but as we've been growing over the past you know, two, two, three years, it's certainly been useful having, you know, a growing team and people who are very dedicated and who I trust to, to really get things going. So I'd say there's still uh, various aspects of the business that I touch day to day, but we have added uh, quite a bit of uh, people, um, additional folks onto the founding team um, that um, have, have really taken on their roles across software dev cloud development um and then various hardware dev but uh, i'm sort of the quarterback moving things along as we go mm -hmm. so no i i know your company is famous for your sweat patch so uh so can you tell me like how much does it cost and like do you know do you know like is there a max number of, of times like someone can use it yeah so in order to answer that, there, there's a couple of different generations of products that um, we have. It's not just one patch. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so there's um, a product that we've launched with PepsiCo and Gatorade. It's out on the market now um, called the GX Sweat Patch. You can um, purchase it online anywhere from $7 to $10 to $12, $14, depending on where um, and how you purchase it. Um we also have a suite of other products for clinical research uh, where we think sweat biomarker discovery is really interesting and important for um, really pinpointing other uh, biomarkers beyond just hydration um, and really tapping in and helping the biotech community do that. Uh, and then uh, we recently announced and are launching uh, what's called the connected hydration solution. Um, it's a uh, wearable that gives you real time continuous monitoring of your sweat profile, as well as your skin temperature, your motion, um, and um, your activity level. So 
Uh, all of that is done in real time. There's also a haptic vibration motor that tells you when you surpass a certain uh, hydration level where you're more at risk of dehydration and need to replenish your sweat loss. Um, and so uh, the common running theme in all of our products is uh, providing feedback on your underpinning hydration or biochemical or metabolic health. And um, uh, our approach has been more enterprise focused. So we don't go direct to consumer. We, mm. uh, we have partners like PepsiCo or we sell to businesses. Um, and, you know, that pricing range, as I mentioned for the GX patch is, you know, that <clears throat> is ultimately a, a consumer product, but we work with PepsiCo to get it out to the market. Um, and um, our other products, Connected Hydration, again, we sell to businesses and it's based on a subscription um, plan. So you basically have the hardware, the cloud, all the data analytics that come with that. And we provide that uh, depending on the, the deployment size, it could be anywhere from a, a few hundred dollars to uh, several hundred dollars per month per user. Um, so that all works out to a couple of dollars or less per day of use. So uh, may I ask why you guys are doing, not doing direct and consumers that selling it to other, like a Gatorade? Yeah, we, we looked at, um, if, few different options of, you know, doing business to business, direct to consumer, uh, selling through channel partners. And um, we, we chose uh, to go after a more enterprise approach because uh, we feel like we have much broader reach that way. And we all had already made significant traction with some big fortune 50 companies. So it just was a real seamless evolution for us to keep pushing that way. Um, direct to consumer is really interesting as well. And, you know, never say never, we could potentially do that down the road. Uh, but, you know, you, you just need a lot more um, resources, more, um, more footing when it comes to sales. Uh, whereas with an enterprise approach, um, you still need to, to make sure um, to reach your customers and, you know, provide all the field support, but uh, the sales channels are much more tight. Uh, you don't have to worry about geographical um, variations and adoptions as much. Um, and so, you know, th those uh, complexities add cost, uh, whereas working with uh, various marquee flagship type customers that are, you know, Fortune 50, Fortune 100, Fortune 200, um, it's much easier to wrap your arms around that than to deal with all the various uh, intricacies of uh, selling through uh, direct to consumer channels, which have a huge variety and heterogeneity across ge geographies and various places. So we just haven't done it. Others have, and I think it's both models are interesting. It's just for us, it was a better fit to go enterprise. So a minute. Is so I mean, so you know, like people wear, wear the Apple Watch and there's an app where it can track like this number of steps you took and stuff. So, does your sweat patch have, this, have a similar app where we get like recommendations and see right. like, you know, the, like the, yeah. the sweat level? Yeah, exactly. So, we provide uh, think of it like a Fitbit for biochemistry essentially. Mm -hmm. So, we, instead of just giving you your step count and heart rate. Uh, it turns out when, once you start to tap into your sweat biomarkers and uh, in tandem with your motion and skin temperature, you could start to provide really unique feedback um, to close the loop with with the user, with the athlete or worker or patient. Uh, and what I mean by that is on the app, we actually uh, show the measurements of how much sodium chloride is measured in your sweat, how much in milligrams you're losing uh, of your total electrolytes, um, how much fluid are you losing across your whole body, uh, and then looking at the contextual data, like skin temperature and um, your, your overall motion. And all of that ties in with some really interesting uh, 
second order data around how many alerts and alarms we may be seeing. So if you're sweating a lot and it's 120 out and you're, you're working, um, uh, they uh, are in a position where, you know, they need to know like what to put back into their body. And so it all turns out to be tied back to recovery. And uh, what, what I really appreciate about this and we iterated and developed this over time is we can provide very tangible feedback as to what you should do. So you need to drink X many ounces um, and Y Z milligrams of electrolytes to kind of come back to your normal state, your baseline. Um, and that, that becomes really powerful for, from the standpoint of the user. Cause uh, you know, just measuring things is interesting, but what do you do with that information is you know, usually 90% of the battle is okay. I measured it, but so what, like, what, what can I uh, do differently? And, and so behavioral changes based on the actionable um, results is really what we're about. And um, you know, we're, we're taking that extra step to look at some new biomarkers, like your sweat profile in conjunction with some of the more existing biophysical metrics, like your steps, motion, skin temperature, and that, that uh, realm of, of, of metrics that exist already. So um, in a nutshell, that's what the app tells you. That's what the device feeds to the app to relay. And then that's ultimately stored longitudinally across the cloud. So you can kind of see what, how you're trending over time based on your diet, based on, your sleep based on your alcohol intake and, and all the rest. I see. So, you know, I know, I know you said like your app tells you it's, if you need to drink any sport drinks and stuff. So is there like, like, do they recommend any type of sport drink? Cause I know Gatorade has its own sports drink, which is Gatorade. I think PepsiCo has Powerade. So, it's, so does the app recommend like a type of brand of sport drinks? So yeah, so, so Gatorade's owned by PepsiCo and Coca-Cola oh, okay. owns Powerade. Um, okay. uh, and then there's a bunch more uh, uh, types of uh, of drinks. So we're on the connected hydration platform. We're agnostic to the, the specific drink. Uh, the app allows you to input what you like to drink and it computes based on the ingredients uh, when you tell it how much you've drank, it automatically computes how much milligrams and ounces of fluid uh, you have uh, taken in to compensate for your loss. So we wanted to keep it very agnostic in that way. So people have different preferences um, and you're, you basically can input and um, there's a there's a, a database of drinks that are already inputted into the app that you can pick from and just scroll through um, just to make it super easy so you can keep track of what you're drinking as well as the the patch that the device tells you what you're losing and those two close the loop together I see so for the patch so it's less so what so do I wear the patch or is it kind of like sticker so? Yeah, great question. So the way it works is think of it like a smart Band-Aid. Um, so Connected Hydration has a little module with a battery and Bluetooth inside. You wear it on your arm. Um, uh, there's an adhesive layer that has these intricate microfluidic patterns underneath it that, uh, that uh, take in sweat droplets directly from your skin. Once the droplets propagate in to the uh, the micro channels, then the electronic module, the Bluetooth uh, module starts to sense and read all that information. And then it stores it in memory or it channels it over to uh, a smartphone device. So uh, all, all, all of that happens in real time as you begin to sweat. And, um, you know, we have different ways of, of addressing, um, People are heavy sweaters versus light, you know, more passive. Uh, we have uh, devices that uh, are currently uh, in development that can even pick up very tiny amounts of sweat, uh, even when you're 
just barely sitting down. Um, so, uh, but that, that, that's really the idea is it, uh, it's a wearable device, kind of like a continuous glucose monitor, but without the needles. So we're not, uh, puncturing through the skin. It's just collecting sweat non-invasively. I see. So no, for your sweat patch, so what type of sports it, um, are we seeing your sweat patch being used in? Uh, so, you know, uh, when we launched the GX sweat patch with Gatorade in 2021, uh, we mainly targeted endurance sports and some team sports, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, football, soccer, ice hockey, um, and then, you know, anything from a Peloton user to a marathon or triathlon runner. Th that's really where we started. And um, we put in a lot of work into publishing and validating our work. And uh, that, that I would say is a key ingredient to adoption and trust and success. And we've spent a lot of time doing that, finding the you know, the sweet spots, but also where, um, uh, we, um, we find our sort of the boundary conditions for what we could do, what we can't do. And so we publish, we validate it across a number of different sports. Um, and, um, the ones that I mentioned were sort of the top ones. There are other sports like tennis, um, as well as, um, uh, you know, track and field type use cases that are really interesting even like pickleball it seems like you know, there's work, some, wow. yeah there we've gotten some inbound from folks who are interested in you know just quantifying hydration levels and pickleball and uh, other sports related to tennis so um uh in general heavy sweat activities are the ones that um you, you find uh there's a significant need um uh, because that's where, you know, there's a lot of loss of electrolytes and fluid loss. So that's, that's where we've started. Uh, but as we found, uh, there was, as soon as we launched our GX sweat patch product, there's just an enormous um, set of uh, more industrial companies that reached out seeking the same type of solution, except for workers. The, think of the connected worker sector as one that's very similar to fitness and athletics, except instead of a two hour match or, you know, a three hour marathon, I uh, imagine workers in the energy sector and underground mining or oil and gas or construction where they have to work eight to 16 hour days. And it's 125 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is the case in parts of Texas, Arizona, all, all throughout the South, really. Um, and, and so th that that's really where we started to broaden out and based on the the need the, the, there there was a good fit for for what we we're doing beyond even just some of those individual and team sports yeah so Matt I wonder to web your company's website I see you have a lot of athletes you got like Messi you got Jason Tatum Serena Williams and I see I know you mentioned football but I didn't see any football athletes so is, is it you guys haven't expanded to like certain football athletes yet uh, we directly uh, haven't uh, done football ourselves, but Gatorade works, uh, especially through their performance partner group. They work with a number of different um, uh, professional football teams. Epicor, we have tested with collegiate football programs and teams. So um, so as part of our development, we've done quite a bit of that, but uh, the, the team at Gatorade has, has done a lot. Um, with football, you mentioned Lionel Messi, Serena Williams, Jason Tatum. Uh, those happen to be some of the legendary athletes who uh, supported, and um, you can see them wearing the patch. And you know, they focus on hydration and sweat loss to educate people. Um, football is not too far away for, from that. Um, the need is is significant, and uh, the amount of data that's been published showing loss mechanisms and loss of fluid in football is is paramount so there's a, a tremendous need for uh, monitoring and uh you know using existing tools it's just been you know urine analysis testing and things like that so having a non-invasive less cumbersome approach via sweat uh, seems like a really good fit for 
for football. I see it. And uh, my next question is, I, I know now you and uh, your company, Gatorade, you're working with like athletes. Are you going to work like sport leagues in the future, like directly? Like, for example, are you going to work with the UFC or the, you no? Know, yeah, so kind of like that. Yeah, we, we've um, we've talked to, and some of it's under wraps still, but yeah, I think there's uh, ways to really uh, approach the marketplace from different angles. And we've been fortunate enough to work with uh, some powerful, large corporations that have you know, a lot of distribution and marketing um, resources. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would fully agree there's, teams, leagues, various nonprofit organizations that uh, are really interesting. And uh, so the answer is yes. We just haven't announced uh, it yet. I, and, uh, you know, I think the, I think the Paris Olympics is coming up. So are, um, are, so are the people listening are like, are we actually going to see your product being used by the athletes there in Paris? Yeah, there's uh, different athletes ac across different sports that train, um, say, um, mostly on the endurance side and, um, you know, various athletes who are um, working with our partners um, uh, have, in fact, you know, whether it was World Cup or Olympics, I, I would expect you you will see some, some noise around uh, the Paris Olympics coming up. Um, and, you know, by uh, across the board, uh, any type of huge events like that, like marathons, um, we've had a number of uh, deployments around the Chicago Marathon, New York Marathon as well, uh, where, you know, various athletes at different levels use it. And that's really the key is it's not just for professionals. It's that's how it started. That's how we really built um, our uh, our knowledge base. But then as soon as we started to publish our papers, it became much more open. And by by design, if you don't publish, if you don't validate, then it's really tough to gain traction because you don't know what you're measuring. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, the targeting some of the, the star professional athletes is just one approach. We've actually focused a lot of energy on the youth athletics programs and things with our partners. Matt, I think recently Nike had their, their sweat patch through the basketball shoes. So I mean, so how's a sweat patch like able to track someone's sweat through their socks? Like because because you're not directly taping on your skin, right? That was more or less just a a, a shoe with certain uh, marketing connections to it. So there there actually wasn't a sweat patch. Oh, the okay. Shoe. It was a Paul George uh, limited edition shoe with Gatorade and Nike. It's a really cool project because uh, the shoe highlights sweat droplets on it. It's built into the industrial design of the shoe itself, uh, but it, it was uh, separate from from the patch, so it wasn't quite integrated. I, I think there's possibilities for integrating in uh, to your lower extremities these types of sensors, uh, but for that particular case, um, it was more or less just the a new shoe design with some sweat and some GX flavor to it. Uh, so, so it's, it's like a PR stunt kind of for you guys. Uh, so the patch and the shoe came out, uh, as part of a Paul George campaign. So, uh, so it wasn't the shoe having sensors in it. Paul George announced the shoe. And part of that was awareness around hydration and the GX sweat patch was highlighted in that. I see. So I meant, I mean, your company has... You know you're you're making some good products so what are some challenges to growing this company uh so with with respect to just you know getting uh an idea off the ground and building out a team and all all the various ins and outs um you know, epicor has come a long way we um you know started out as a university spin out um our uh, biggest focus right now is around scale up. And that happens to be, um, you know, in part uh, in the U S but also we've gotten a lot of international interest with climate change and extreme heat effects happening, not just, you know, in the U S but places like Asia, the middle East, um, 
that has really piqued our interest to make sure we uh, sequence things out, but also plan, um, bring in partners, bring in investors. And so that, that, that's been our key focus over the past uh, year or so. And um, it, it's, uh, you know, really entering into that next phase of growth to, you know, now that we've launched one, two, our third product coming out, which is, you know, end to end, we have a full cloud, full analytics, how we do that um, and do it in an international way is a big challenge. And uh, we're tackling it now as we speak. I see. So no, just in the future, like, like what are you going to track next? Like, is it stress levels? Or is this something else? Yeah, there's a number of different biomarkers that are really interesting, some of which have been validated, tested across different studies by by us, uh, as well as other uh, groups out there. Um, stress is really interesting. Um, and one way to quantify and uh, try to make sense of stress, this very broad term, is looking at cortisol levels. Um, is one way, uh, still very early, um, from, from the, uh, clinical outcome standpoint, but I think, uh, could be really interesting, um, as a quantitative biomarker that we can measure, that we could relate to disease, to sleep, to stress, to pain, maybe. Um, uh, so all, all of those, uh, factors are sort of built into cortisol. And then, you know, there's others like, uh, you know, tracking muscle fatigue by way of uh, lactate, other uh, biomarkers that tell us about your immune response, like cytokines um, that are also found in your sweat as well as in your blood. Um, so these various uh, biomarkers, the, the biggest challenge is figuring out the fit from a market standpoint, but then also overcoming some of the technical risk. Um, uh, so that that's one way to think about it, and um, you know, keep in mind there's also some of these other um, really interesting avenues where you can relate biophysical metrics with some of the biochemical and make sense that way. And you know, that what I mean by that is, you know, what does your sodium and your sweat loss tell you in conjunction with your skin temperature and your motion activity, heart rate. Um, uh, blood pressure as well. So uh, all, all of these are really interesting next frontier types of questions that, you know, uh, Epicor as a company, as a university spin out one with the DNA that we publish and get our patents and new, new research out there into the public domain. Um, we uh, try to stay on the forefront of that, uh, both on the hardware uh, biochemistry side, but as well as, you know, getting the publications out there. So I want to go back a bit. I know you co-founded another company called, um, with John Rogers for the, uh, it was the thin cap for the athletes. So why did you decide to co-found it? Uh, so, so that company, um, called MC10, we co-founded in around 2009, 2010, uh, was also a wearable, uh, uh, sensor platform. And, um, we ended up launching a couple of products over about a 10 year period, um, eight, eight to 10 years. Um, one was the, um, the, uh, the smart headband called check light that you just mentioned. Um, and, uh, the idea there was to really quantify head impacts and uh, to help athletes with head injuries and, and things, especially football, soccer, other sports. And it turns out that's a really key focus now with various athletics, make sure these chronic hits to the head don't amount to really lasting injuries to your, uh, to your brain. Um, uh, but where we spent a lot of our time was building out this um, device called the bio stamp um, in a cloud and, app that that really went with it um uh, and it was built for movement disorder neurological diseases um uh taking this flexible stretchable technology that was invented by professor john rogers uh, myself and other team members that founded mc10 um and uh we focused on movement disorders because uh it was fairly nascent in 
uh, from the standpoint of uh, device technologies. Uh, there, you know, a lot of patients, uh, but a lot of them were using diaries to really track their their um, health and progress. So if you're a Parkinson's patient and you go to the doctor once every six months, you're basically using a diary to um, to track your tremors and your your gait and your overall state of well-being. Uh, turns out that's not good enough. Uh, it's been the way it is for decades now, but having uh, a way to quantify better was was the focus with the biostamp and um, um, in that sense, you know, similar underlying theme providing uh, eyes and ears where you don't traditionally have it and then providing feedback to the physician or the patient on what to do. Um, are the drugs working, for example, if you're a Parkinson's patient or an MS patient? And uh, so the biostamp basically enabled that 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 type of feature set. So I want to talk more about the cap. I know you said it's like a it was called a check light. So is there some type of light that tells if the person's having a severe injury or mild injury? Yeah, that that's that was the intent um, for for the product and what at the time Reebok and and others were very interested in. Uh, it wasn't a diagnostic, however, so it wasn't telling you. Uh, from from like a medical diagnosis standpoint, it was telling you more or less what kind of impact was felt near the the, the cranium. Um, and uh, so with that, you either got uh, a yellow or a red type of light to go off based on the, uh, the impact that was felt. Um, so it was really to raise awareness uh, so that athletes can and coaches could see uh, if someone was you know, experiencing some type of heavy, heavy hit. I see. So uh, why do you sell it to another company? I, I know you're, I know you don't work there anymore, but why do you sell it to, to MediData Solutions? Oh, uh, it was a really good fit. Um, MediData has um, a clinical trial business. Um where they rely on a number of different um, biometrics coming in. And uh, our team, as well as uh, the technology, was just a really good fit for clinical trials. We had done a number of uh, clinical trials in the neurology um, uh, movement disorder space, and that seemed to be the, the best fit for the technology to, uh, to really come to life in a big way. Yeah, and another question is, I'm, I've I've met some scientists who've been on this podcast, and once their company got sold to another company, they usually stay in that company as like an advisor. So, why do you leave your your own company you founded? Is it because you wanted to have like a new adventure? Sure. Or, yeah. Or was no, I, yeah. No. Great question. I um started MC10 and it was an amazing ride. We worked on a number of different technologies, some of which came to market. And um, what really drives me personally is the early stages to getting things off the ground and you know developing technology so that it becomes uh, mainstream. And we had done that with the BioStamp and getting the products out. So I ended up uh, leaving uh, MC10 to go join his faculty at Northwestern. And then uh, that in turn led to some new, really exciting opportunities that um, led to uh, Epicor spinning out. And uh, that, that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, so, you know, for everyone, it's different. Some people like to, um, um, you know, sort of the bigger company culture. Um, I, I really like the um, getting things off the ground um part of you know the evolution um and uh with mc10 it certainly uh we went through a number of different uh experiences with different products and figured out you know how do we actually even engineer this new type of flexible wearable um that took a number of years with epicor similarly it's it's another disruptive tech in the sense that you know, there wasn't anything before it. So, you know, microfluidics have been around, but only the kind that you could put on your bench top and run 
you know, syringe pumps with tubes too. Um, we had to figure out how do you wear something like that on the skin and have sweat and other biofluids flow through. Turned out that, uh, you know, it takes some time and that, that there lies the attraction for me. It's building something new. And I think me and my co-founders are all very similar in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, we work together, a few other companies and, um, you know, the, the challenge of taking a concept that hasn't existed. And then, you know, on top of that, from a university lab to overcoming the, uh, what's called, I think the chasm of the Valley of death, like, how do you take it to that next level? Um, that's really the the biggest challenge. Um, and one that, um, you know, if you succeed, it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun to, to, to go through. Yeah. And so I think recently Forbes recognized you as the future work 50. So you're lost like people like Sam Altman. So like for you personally, it's like, what's your next mission or next step? Yeah, we're, um, you know, given uh, the past one to two years, uh, the awareness and impact of climate change has really come full center uh, as far as, you know, the public, media, various research groups are all very focused. And, uh, and we're um, extremely um, passionate about, you know, how do we take our technology and have impact in this, in this realm? Uh, it started out with sports, but now we've seen that there's a lot more um, applications where there's need. You know, how do we make sure uh, people in the Middle East who work countless hours, even at nighttime uh, for night shifts, it's unbearable conditions where your organs are on the verge of you know, essentially failing or you know, the heat is so great. So how do we how do we enable people to understand their own personal physiology to be able to adapt and, and work? Because uh, the work isn't going away. <laughs> you, know, you still need energy. You still need farming. You still need people out there doing things. And in some cases, these are pregnant women. In other cases, they're children. There's you know, various folks uh, who work 16 hour, 18 hour shifts. And uh, some people uh, who are just happen to be outside uh, consumers. So how do we deal with that? I think that's really the big frontier for us. Um, and that that's exciting for me. And I think for the entire Epicore team. Yeah, I mean, so I want to ask another question for you right now. So I think we all know AI has been really popular. People are using chat GPT. So, and I know many companies are, are incorporating AI into their products. So is, is, so, um, is your company trying to incorporate you know, similar, similar stuff into your, into your app maybe? Yeah, we, we've looked at various tech and approaches. Um, uh, and you know, our, our main focus was first, let's, let's make sense of the data that we're collecting and, understand it because it's all brand new, you know, even relating temperature and sweat. Um, so we didn't really dive into it uh, in the way that other companies have, mainly because we we're still wrapping our heads around what 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 does the data look like, build that database, build, build um, the various um, uh, different um, uh, user bases that we know, build start to make sense of things. But as we've gotten going, especially this year, past six months, there's correlations and trends. And um, what we're working on uh, probably in the next year or so, uh, finding some predictive approaches is definitely interesting. We're probably going to publish it first before we start highlighting it and putting it out there. Um, just uh, spirit of making sure we understand what's going on. But as as we do that, I think, um, you yeah, know, it's really a unique set of data coming together and our, our team is looking at ways of, of starting to see if we could predict certain phenotypes or, uh, or um, physiological responses that could happen. I think that that could be really impactful in the future. Yeah, so I mean, I went on your bio and said you were board advisors for Blendor and I know it's like Blendor is not biotech or some type of companies or some type of stuff that your 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 field is. 
So why do you join Blendor? Yeah, I was uh, an advisor. Um, I was started by an MIT alum, uh, Sloan alum, MIT Sloan alum, who I know pretty well, um, and uh, really excited about you know their their mission to to help with um, various recruiting platforms to uh, open up opportunities for those who may miss out, and um, you know that coupled with the technology aspects of you know how. Um, uh, you know, you could really enable uh, new algorithms and, and ways to, to help um, identify people who, who may otherwise have been overlooked based on social demographic, race, gender, various other factors. Um, so that, that was really appealing to me and having it be another MIT spin out, you know, have a, um, a warm place for a uh, soft spot for for uh, different spin out. So I knew the founder and, um, was really excited about what they were doing. So, I mean, right now you say you have 20 people, you probably could expand more. So it, right now, are you using Blendor to recruit more people or are you still using like LinkedIn or Indeed? No, we, we haven't, uh, because we're more or less a small team uh, at Epicor. Um, uh, and, you know, most of our hires have actually been through one degree, two degrees of separation, really. Um, so I haven't really gone through much of a formal recruiting process. We've done a little bit, but not not a whole lot. It's, uh, you know, through our network in Chicago and in the Boston area, even on the West Coast, uh, it's just easier uh, through the people we already know, at least to start. And then we'll see where we go from here. Mm -hmm. So you're you're on the uh, board of the the biomarkers journal and sensors. So how do you you know? So I I know I I know no you know trying to make a paper on a journal is really hard. So how do you like like accept a paper and you know just not 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 have a paper on a journal? Like do you know is there some kind of type of criteria in there? Uh, you're talking about digital biomarkers, that journal? Yeah, yeah. So my question is asking, like, how do you accept the paper or, you know, is there oh, some type of yeah. criteria? Yeah, so uh, as with um, most peer review publications and journals out there, uh, there's a number of editors um, that play a role, um, uh, as well as uh, reviewers that get called in to review papers. Typically two, maybe up to three or four reviewers get called in. Um, and so as an editor or chief editor, um, you know, my my role has been to make sure we um, push various specific topics, you know, coverage uh, research fields, um, bring it front and center. Um, but then also as articles come in to make sure we recruit in the right reviewers um, and maybe even special editors to help. Um, but typically a paper will go through um, one to two rounds of reviews before the authors have addressed all the um, all the issues, maybe technical, some may be experimental, others may be just like grammatical um, uh, and more figure-based updates that need to be made. Um, uh, and then once that first, second review happens and the reviewers are, are accepting of the state or status of the paper, then the editorial staff comes in and decides whether it's publishable and paper is accepted or rejected. Or um, another possibility is that you say, look, if you make major revisions, then maybe we'll take another look once you're done making those updates. So uh, it is a fairly elaborate process, could take anywhere from like three to six to nine months. Um, um, so, you know, it, it, it's why uh, manuscripts and publications, you know, take a lot of time to, to, to put together and then ultimately publish. So is there any advice that you would give to students or young people who want to become scientists and people that own startups and stuff? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's always uh, finding out what you're most passionate about. So, you know, some people really like to be focused on the research side and 
want to become faculty and just focus there. And I think that's uh, a great thing. It's a, you know, a very productive careers could be had just doing that. Um, it's very competitive, uh, you know, even more so if you're geographically constrained um, to become a faculty member in places. Um, but I, I think it's definitely a an, a, a an occupation that's born out of love. You don't want to just become a professor just for the hell of it. You should um, be be interested and love to to mentor and teach and do research. Um, uh, so that you know, if I, I would say that's an area where you know I I gave it some serious thought. Do I you know go down that path and then. You know, other uh, possibilities are, you know, if you're really interested in seeing technology come to life, come to fruition, well, then you probably should be more on the translational side of things. And some people start with faculty and then go over to more uh, industry or translational and starting their own companies and things. And uh, everyone's different. Um, I, I think my passion is uh, tends to be more on the translational side. Um uh, while at the same time keeping an anchor in how do we make sure that the ground level research and the publications really push the 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 the, the engine and the 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 motion forward the momentum forward so um i, I think uh th those are two key areas um that i'm fairly comfortable with and um uh I think the listeners here may find that they like, you know, one area like academia more, in which case, you know, you go down that path. Others may be pure industrial biotech. I want to go, you know, start a company right after undergrad. And then I'm sort of the middle in the middle uh, where I um, looked at both, both camps and really bridged the gap. And um that that third tier is kind of the most uh, unique and you know in some ways least defined path, um, but it's one that I, I feel I'm I, I love it because I get to kind of see both sides, and you know the closest is faculty members who start in faculty and then go off and start companies and kind of keep their foot uh, within the research and academia realm. Uh, doing startups takes so much time that it's really tough to do both well. So if you look at what I do um, and my focus, it's 120% now with uh, startup, you know, making sure Epicor succeeds. And uh, it's, you know, so you sort of have to decide wh which is going to be your focus um, end of the day. And, um, you know, others just like to do research and publish and have grad students. And that's a perfectly uh, impactful path to take, but uh, you ultimately have to decide w which is going to be your, your ultimate focus. And then which is going to be sort of your intermediate or area where you just feed, um, feed forward from. So is DF, I mean, I know I've asked a lot of questions. So DF, a a anything else that you want to say to the audience? Uh, maybe I'll just wrap up with, um, uh, you know, if you look across the board, um, a lot of the podcast um, speakers, uh, just doing a quick glance, come from academia and have done translational work. Um, you know, that's uh, an area that I'm very focused on. Um, there are certainly other ways of starting companies and uh, some people just do it out of their dorm rooms and, you know, without any like research and faculty uh, oversight. Um, uh, so th there's a lot of ways to start companies, uh, but within the realm of, of um, having unique technology come out of a university uh, and typically hardware tech, maybe some AI, you know, real groundbreaking software could, could follow the same trajectory. Um, it, it's really important to have, you know, really good mentors, people who've really been through it before. Um, so one piece of advice I would give is, um, you know, really surround yourself with people who um, don't just have 
uh, the 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 title, but who've actually been through it, um, really makes uh, a, a real difference for young entrepreneurs to come out. And um, you know, you should definitely accept advice from all, but uh, from especially useful from people who've gone through and have the battle scars. Um, and they may not all have like fancy titles. They may, you know, be people who are sort of undercover entrepreneurs who, you know, started companies, exited, but then had some fail. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think you learn a lot more from people who've actually been through it as opposed to, you know, advisors who, um, you know, have good experience in big companies, but haven't really done the startup um, on their own. So I would take, you know, feedback from all comers, but really important to surround yourself with people who have been through the trenches and know, know exactly what the, what the good, the bad and the ugly all looks like. Oh yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jafar for being part of this episode and giving me the, the chance to, to talk to you. So I, I think people, so people can learn more about, you know, not only business, but also the uh, wearable side. Yeah, I appreciate the time and um happy to follow up if there's any other questions. <laughs>